I quickly went over that, but you should have covered this in levelling somewhere in your course, the, the impact of um, refraction. Now, in monitoring and precise work, the real key is their absolute control over foresight and backsight distances. So you remember that bit, of, if you read the bit on precise levelling, in metrology it said you have to then bring all those things into account, right? So here, precise levelling and levelling itself is important because vertical movement is a critical thing in a lot of these structures. So for bridges, dams, things of that nature, right? Vertical movement is a big indicator of possible failure. So often uh, you can level something far quicker than you can actually measure it and then go and reduce it all. But uh, in comps B, I think you did um, a least squares adjustment of a level net. Yeah. Yeah. Did it come work out? Yep. Yep. 175 miles. 175. Uh, life's easy. <laughs> I'm sending for that question, and then there's another question that's worth 125. That's that's 50% of the uh, um, exam. Yeah. And but each question takes you roughly 10 to 15 minutes. You first start off in doing it for an hour, it takes you an hour. The second time you do it, it takes you around 45 minutes. The third time you do it, it takes you 30 and then so you will do it. <laughs> if, if, look, if, he, if you did the course again next year, you'd be able to do it just like that. You could sit, sit on yeah. the exam and go. I did it two years ago. I just, I just look at it and I can see the results. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We need to look a little bit more at what you did in comps B to make it integrate more with what we're doing here, um, because there is this actual slide will prove it. This is a problem with um, a lot of the students that understanding the difference between minimally constrained and fully constrained or partially constrained networks, right? Now, I haven't looked at your comp speed to see if you actually cover that, but it shows in the assignments and questions that people are not completely au fait with it. Look up the notes, read them carefully, just make sure, and it's not that complex a, uh, a issue. It is also in the ICSM, you know, they will note that, right? And what you've got to do is decide what you're going to do. Don't change horses middle course, right? Don't start off with, you know, Epoch 1, we're going to have, uh, we'll do it minimally constrained. Oh, the next Epoch can make fully constrained the whole network, you know. You are not going to get the same results. Understand it. I mean, I'm not going to go into great detail here, but I think you should, if you don't understand what it means, if you can't draw a diagram, um, then you need to go back and look at material. And there's lots of material even you'll find online um, about, uh, if you search for, um, Deacon, a guy named Deacon RMIT, who's to be a great lecturer there, um, minimally and maximally constrained or networks. I think he's got some papers he left online that you can read. It's not a, it's not a difficult complex, but it's just something I highlight that a lot of the students don't seem to follow it. Okay, so whichever way you, you're trying to do it, the whole idea of an epoch adjustment, you know, you've done all the observations, right, is to analyse to check for stability first. It's like a stage thing. Because when you do the observations, you're also reading control and targets, right? So has the control moved? And if it has, where? Now this is where you do have to be very au fait with it, whatever software you use, right? Or if you're doing it by hand, because you have to know, well, it's almost like you're doing a pre-analysis again, saying it looks like it's in this line. Is that possible? Go back to your pre-analysis and say, was that line a weak line? Look at the error ellipses, right? Okay. Do you have a good assessment of the uncertainties? The first one's a little bit about, you know, intelligently looking at it. The second one's something that actually people seem to have an issue with. You know, what is the uncertainty when you read... What is, what is it when you actually read the manufacturer specifications and they say, you know, the Topskin whatever is plus or minus three seconds in direction? What does that mean? Is it the angle plus or minus three seconds? Is the direction, the direction is usually defined as a, a number relating to a certain datum, right? Or is the bearing plus or minus three seconds? Or is it the pointing? You'll find very few specifications will actually tell you from the manufacturers. Um, I can tell you it's actually, generally speaking, it's the pointing. 
And sometimes they won't even tell you is it 95% or 68. According to the ISO standards, it should be a 95, the, the test they should do, right? But it's something that you need to be aware of. And then some people will say, and some people said this in the assignment, that, that uh, question 1, 2 was incorrect because when you take face left and face right, it's two pointings. So you're already, if you take one lot of face left and face right, you're already cutting it down, right? What you've got to do is think laterally again and go, don't believe everything, right? Unless you've actually gone out and turned 1,500 angles in all sorts of conditions with that particular instrument and did your own statistical analysis, you know, be conservative. So that's why we recommended in that case go, be conservative, presume it's a pointing, call a pointing a face left and a face right, and that's why you ended this plus or minus 5.6 seconds or whatever it was, right? Now, that's by being conservative. It's only when that conservative measure fails you and you don't end up with the results you want that you can go back and re-examine it. But make sure that your assessment of the uncertainties and the observations, this bit here, right, um, include those that you may even have to guess. Those things we're saying, refraction, centering, you know, I mean, do you really know what you sent it to? Or are you just estimating it? But leaving them out is not a good idea. Leaving them out is a, a bad thing, right? A good guess is better than bad value. Okay, use of multiple models is okay, but you must understand what the accepted model is going to be. Okay, the statistical tests, you've told me you actually did all this, right? chi squared test. If you're not really happy, read it in the, in the study book again this time and see if you... And particularly, tell us if you disagree, if you don't think that's what you understood it to be, um, so that we can look at the way we're explaining it as well, right? Chi-squared tests are used very commonly, in, particularly in adjustments. And then the two other ones, the Fisher F and the student T tests. Fisher F is a very important test, uh, particularly comparing precisions. Can you mix and match different equipment when you know their precisions? Okay, as we did for the, the originally, when you're comparing epoch observational sets, are they based on the same datum? Very important, right? Should never be any doubt about that. Is the network scale you use the same? You can see things like using even Starnet. You know, you only have to change one parameter. You know, it's like some people put 100 in for the average height instead of 10. That's just a mistake. It did, it did make a slight, slight difference, right? The appropriate standard deviations are important. And the same approximate coordinates. So when you repeat the exercise, start off with your approximate coordinates, maybe improve them a little bit, right? And then use that for your pre-analysis for the future, right? Okay. And, and linearization is, you know, linearization is nonlinear programs, uh, equations, that you have to find the difference in them, like for, for error propagation, they have to be linearized. Taylor's linearization is the usual thing. Okay, two epochs. We're getting near the end of it. The two epoch thing is one epoch tells you what the situation is now. It doesn't tell you about any change, right? So the second epoch, you take that to go, has the stability of the reference points the control? Has it changed, right? Is it in a single area? Um, is it the whole lot? You know what? If all your control points change. Say there was a massive earth movement, right? It's pretty tough. The only thing you would probably pick that with, and that's why you see a lot of this now, is even if the measurements aren't made with the GNSS, there is usually one station in the control net that has long range, long term GNSS readings, because that gives you an independent check of the ground. GNSS is not um, linked to ground deformation. Okay, you want to look for suitable deformation models, right? So for you, and you, if you have a target, you say, oh, well, the delta x, delta y, delta z is this, and you're telling an engineer, right, or telling anyone, you may actually go, well, that's fine. What you should do is convert those into a direction. So a simple example would be if you've got a, a wall like that, right, say it's some sort of dam wall or side of a casing, and you've got a point here, a target, and we end up with a sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, right, between two epochs, 
or delta, you know, the way you look at it, that number probably doesn't mean anything. If you converted that into a vector, a three-dimensional vector, right, if that vector happened to be like that, it tells you that it's vertical to the wall. If the vector happened to be like this, mostly in the x, in the z, it's probably likely to indicate ground level changes or slumping of the concrete or something similar. So don't just accept that you're going to end up with a bunch of numbers. Surveyors have a bit of a problem of really liking numbers. I mean, some of you on the assignment just punched out those star net outputs and just covered pages with them, right? No analysis, just cover the pages. But I mean, so make sure the numbers are meaningful to someone else. So where you can, try to actually transform your X, Y, Z changes into a vector form. You know, so a deformation helps the deformation model. Um, you save those changes. You have to look at how you document all this, right? Because if you have to do a, re a quick deformation, say in, a, in a, a flood situation, it may be important to be able to compare these vectors very quickly, right? To see if there's also a change in the vector direction. So you can see if I said oh, delta x, delta y, delta z was, you know, 5, 10, 15, right? And then I come back and you go, well, you know, what's the hypotenuse theoretically between that? But if I came back and said it's 10, 5, 5 now, the magnitude hasn't changed, but if the direction has changed, you would say, well, something has gone wrong. Something else has happened in the deformation. Okay. The two things, uh, it's discussed more in the thing, but uh, you'll see these terminologies used. Unless you actually get involved in monitoring of large structures to a high degree, you can accept them as they're explained there, right? So there are models on how you compare two epochs. There's robust methods and non-robust. Robust is a term often used in error analysis that doesn't actually mean it's strong or not strong, actually. Okay, these methods are all outlined. There's obviously a lot of them, and there's probably even more now. The last one is the, is the UNB is the University of New Brunswick, a very well-known surveying university in Canada. Um, yeah. I gave a three-hour lecture there, and you know they gave me? A hamburger and a can of Coke. Yeah. For, no um, gratuity, nothing. No bottles of wine. Nah, definitely not that. <laughs> okay, so just, you will find the UNB method is like, you know, if you looked at the Corps of Engineers, a few other people, it's commonly used. Just be aware that there are a number of methods, and they do change the way you look at it. So... This is the shape on the bottom, right? There's something you'll see in, we saw it in metrology, right? That there are all these strains, and you'll see it again in when we do uh, Module 9 on high-rise buildings, is just be, be able to picture those in your head. Now you start off with a cube, rotate it, right? And you have, if you rotate along the longitudinal axis, that's the roll. Vertical axis is the yaw, right? And the last axis you have is going to be the pitch. But you can also squeeze it. So you can take a cube, stretch it, and you end up with a rectangular type prism, right? You can squeeze it the other way. It's still a rectangular prism, but totally different dimensions. You can stretch it on one face. Shear is like that. Shear is when you go up and down on the side, right? And there's different shear strains. Now, these are very common terms in civil engineering. And you may see them when you're doing monitoring because they'll talk about the shear strain or the shear level can't be more than some, a certain value. So the generalised method is, and this is probably the only one you really need to think about the terms for, you identify the deformation model you know, right back in the beginning of this lecture. You estimate the deformation parameters. You remember the little flowchart thing we had? And then you do a diagnostic or statistical analysis and a selection of the best fit model. Now, this is actually gets quite complex. But once you get the data, you can do this. What I need to emphasize with surveyors is you start right from the point of building that monument, doing the pre-analysis, doing the observations. You must be in control of everything up to this point. 
you must be able to get to this point and say, I know what the uncertainties are at a certain confidence level. Right. Um, and there is a, a very common program now called SAIT, which is just simultaneous adjustment. Right. You don't have to learn these, right, but you do have to read through them so you're aware of the types of things that are different, right? So when you compare them, there is another way of doing it, and this is, I think, what you're probably looking at the assignment a little bit, is that you are, uh, you can compare observations. As we said with alignment, right, you know, with our things in alignment, what you're really doing is comparing observations. It's supposed to be in a line, it's not. Well, you can compare distances. It doesn't always have to be in a coordinate base. So you could actually compare distances directly, and if the distances are in a direction, say, that's critical, then that observation of comparison of distances is just as good as any fancy adjustment. Okay, the problem with this is that you have to measure exactly the same thing every time. You know, over many, many years, because the, uh, that's the period of monitoring. So there is a downside to it. Um, there's a bit more detail in the study book about that. Okay, this is more common now, is to integrate both the geodetic, the geotechnical, right, and structural integration. So what we're doing is your deformation monitoring creates a vector for either one point, or say if you're laser scanning, millions of points. What you want to do is compare those points with the geotechnical movement or deformation expectations, right? And then add anything else you know. So if you've got a tilt meter, you know, like we saw before, a little tilt meter, measures tilt in two directions, right? Then that should be the direction that your vector is showing movement. Can you see that? I mean, obviously there will be slight differences. So integration of the equipment nowadays is more and more common, particularly with high-rise buildings, because the this can all be done by wireless or Bluetooth connections, and the person monitoring it gets all the data at once, right? So uh, in, in dams, you'll see a lot of fixed cabling is uh, one of the ways of doing it, because you don't want to drag it back out again. Okay, um, best to explain this in... Read the text, look at this here. There are some simple things. If actually, if you're reading a distance, do you compare the, what you expect the standard deviation to be, right, at a confidence level, and what you what difference you got? So for the first epoch, time one, right, time zero, you've got the sigma x1, sigma y1, sigma z1, right? And then the second epoch, you've got the same thing except for two, right? Then you go for the distance of a distance x, right, is x2 minus x1, say for example. You can see a very simple equation, right? at a 95%. So you know what you expect to get. What's outside of that, if you leave it a variance or a standard deviation, right, then it's the that should be matched to the permissible error. Okay, so you can actually do this um, by direct measurement. Now this, in some books you'll see it's called the SETS measurement, SETS method. So in other words, if you set up on a, uh, a control point, C X, right? And you measure everything else the same way, and you come back next month and measure it the same way. You know, you could do a least squares adjustment of the whole thing, but you could just compare the angles and distances that you got from each epoch, right? So there are simpler ways than actually doing a full blown analysis. Um, or you could mix that with your own knowledge of error propagation. Now, for each, each distance, given the vertical angle, the horizontal angle, you know, and the distance, you know, you can see with your spreadsheet, you can come and say, well, this is what I expect the target standard deviation will be. Okay, and you can also compute an error ellipse from that, which is easy if you've got software, less easy if you're doing it by hand, right? Okay, now, if you've got two, do you understand this? If you've got two, two points that change, right? You can only form a single line, a vector. Might be in 3D space, but it's just a line. Until you get three points, three epochs, you don't get a trend. That all, I mean, it's just basic mathematics, but it should be clear to you that that's actually, you need, you. so at the beginning of a monitoring program, maybe you might be enticed to actually take more 
um, epochs just to start off a trend pattern. Okay, you could have a single block displacement or a whole structure deformation. In other words, you could break the information down to not points. I mean, you, you don't know. What does the engineer want? Do they go, look, I've just given you a spreadsheet with uh, 45,000 you know, derived points from my laser scanning and control survey. And he says, I want to know whether or not the, um, the western wall is actually moving. So that requires communication, and this is what this is talking about is, is there a trend in a block or is the whole structure? Is the whole structure sinking, right? I mean, have a look in Springfield. You know you have building A and building B. Have you been to Springfield? No? Oh, they, they're pretty strict if they let in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? Well, you know you have building A and building B and surveying's in B, right? Uh, building A is moving. So in the future years, maybe some of your students actually get a chance to monitor it. It actually is moving. It's cracking. Um, probably because it's built over an old creek, I think. If you look up on the hills, you can see a gully line. It comes a long time ago, right? It's not falling apart, but it is cracking. Um, and an interesting exercise for students would be to actually go, how would you design a monitoring program for that? You know? And don't attend lectures in that building. <laughs> okay. So do you understand the single block displacement whole structure? Can you break the structure up into a few things that are identifiable? Now, you are supposed to be the mathematical expert and the three-dimensional expert. You could be either asked to do that or you should be proactive and do it. In other words, you should see break the structure down to things yourself to go, I know that the support buttress, buttress for this particular bridge right, is separately constructed. You know, we, 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 let's have a look at our monitoring points on that. Are the some of the vectors different to say the you know, the uh, the other buttresses or the other side of the valley you, that particularly you would look at you know with a dam or a, a bridge you wouldn't expect both sides of the um, unless you had massive earthquake right earth movement wouldn't be the same on a steep gorge okay detect a movement take it to a vector it's far easier to actually determine the um, deformation and to check against what they call the deterministic modelling. Remember the FEM, finite ele element modelling? Okay, it's deformation trends are subject to systematic errors. You can get it wrong, particularly if you haven't got many epochs. And this is why you should at least have an understanding of that if you're... If someone says, oh, you need to monitor the stem. We think that, you know, if you do it every five years, it should be enough. You need to be able to point out and go, well, it won't be until year 10 that we can actually tell you any trend. Then they might wake up and go, well, hang on, we want to know before then. You know, so you could be part of that discussion. And going back to our virtually the same type of diagram where we went from the object model, right, to the measurement model, geotechnical sensors, geodetic, the surveying stuff, data collation. Now what we're adding to it is Epoch 1, Epoch 2, and we end up with a analysis. That then, it's not, yeah, okay, that gives you one displacement. Can you see that? Now, if it's actually massive, you probably get worried, right? But it's really when you get to this point here, between Epoch 2 and Epoch 3, where you get a real trend coming back, and then so on. Each time that gets fed, every time it gets fed back into that, you either change the deformation model, you require the engineers, or you change your measurement model. I mean, you might go back and say, I'm going to rerun the pre-analysis. We keep on getting movement in one line, and the engineers say, we don't think it's moving. It shouldn't move there. Well, you've got to check the way you're measuring, your measurement model, right? Does that diagram make sense to you? Yeah, you sort of see the flow, and it's an iterative flow in over many years. Okay, um... You can read this in the text. It actually is a bit depressing because it tells you about a lot of errors that you probably didn't think were there. Um, and it, but it gives you a overview of the type of equipment you'd use, right? So, for example, you don't use GNSS for short-range comparison and distances. It's very good the longer the distance is apart and it's independent of Earth movement. So you have reasons to use... GNSS, but you've got to use it for the right reasons. 
And nowadays it's probably not as bad because it used to be a lot more expensive to buy, you know, a a two station with a base station GNS setup setup. But now you've got core station things like that. So it helps. Um, geotechnical sensors you might be required to actually locate where they go. That's a bit like a construction surveying thing, right? But you might also be required to actually mathematically check. So things like inclinometers in particular, you know, someone saying, is your data consistent with the inclinometers? Or the accelerometers, which show also a vector. So you sort of get used to actually thinking your 3D space in terms of vectors. Um, obviously, high, high precision metrology would be great, but you, as you saw in metrology, a lot of it's around the high precision comes from being in a controlled environment. A lot of the monitoring we're doing is uncontrolled. And close range photogrammetry is becoming more and more um, viable with the increase in mathematical models you can use. You saw that um, in the um, software you used in the last course. Um, and not so much in the quality of the, ca the, quality of the cameras is now uh, not as critical. Right? Uh, in actual fact, there's a company in the UK, I think I mentioned it, or I'm not sure, in Metrology, that uh, you can hire out uh, a Nikon 9000 or whatever it is camera, take it to your factory and they actually say, well, here's some tables, so if, the, if your object, our, well, we have a Bugatti sports car, right? They'd say, oh, move back, you know, if, if it's 11 metres long, move back half the distance and take at least five shots along that side, you know, and then just send us back the images. So it's, and yet that SLR cameras haven't improved in dramatically, right? Um, that's your, your boss, Kevin, that's what both him and I worked on in our masters was um, traffic accident reconstruction and plane crash reconstruction using cameras. We didn't have digital cameras, but we only had film with cameras. So you actually had to take them to the chemist and, or do it yourself. Not like now where you can just flick through them easier. And you didn't have the software like you had for that last course, which is, I think that was actually a really interesting uh, exercise doing that. And, and some of the precision wasn't that bad, was it? You know, when you, like a garage door you had, you compared the lengths. I was a bit surprised at how um, accurate it was, considering it was pretty basic the way it was done. So. Yeah, it's probably your window. It's probably your view. Your view on life is the problem. There's nothing wrong with the measurements, it's just your view on life. It's sad, isn't it? <laughs> and there's all these people out who are going to be watching this online, you know, and they're, they're, they're probably tears are flowing now, feeling sad for you. Okay, laser scanners, um, so that last bit I just had there, uh, are becoming, uh, a lot of you have done quite a bit of work on laser scanners. They're becoming more popular. They still haven't been used as much in deformation they're used in mapping surfaces and comparing them, right? But for really accurate deformation, there's not as much. There's too much inconsistency within the scan profiles. But that may well change, right? Um, you know, as it gets to more where a laser scanner is just a total station taking hundreds of measurements. A laser scanner with decent control and limitations on the size you use is a good thing. Okay, there's um, dam characteristics that you should, when you're thinking about control, this is the one from central Queensland. So relatively simple, you can see it's a it's a relatively simple dam, right, with a crest over it. He only had two control stations. They've been there since the 1950s, right, and one PSM. So not much to work with. Um, and the targets were, you know, old um, uh, bolts in the surface. So he had to make new targets for the future and set out more control. So it was an interesting exercise and one you, you could think about and go, what would you do? There's not enough redundancy there. You can see that someone takes the PSM out and you lose all those years' data. So one of the first things was to establish another PSM. Um, yeah, you're going to know it's possible. That's why the little road's drawn there. A and B are subject to movement. Always presume. You know, so the PSM. Yeah. But you know what you do? It's like in most of those, you have to make a decision. You go, I can't put another PSM somewhere. So think laterally, right? I must protect that PSM or I must put up a, an old, you know, a good recovery for it. Even the recovery is halfway along. You know, like something that's I've precisely put in 
or I will actually do this all on a 24-hour, 36-hour GNSS observation, right, to make sure that I could recover it using GNSS. It might be more expensive. I'd have to be there for a lot of time. But the worst case scenario. But so he, he came up with ideas. But one of his biggest things is these earth dams tend to sink, right? And that's an indication that there's going to be a problem because the means their colloidal clays inside them are collapsing. So they don't just all sink down; they break up, and then the water goes through, and you know, big problems. So how he puts the targets, he wanted to put other targets, but he's actually found out that he can level with the precise level fairly quickly, fairly often. Instead of taking like a total station out, resetting up and reading all the stuff, he can do that quite often, right? So that was one of the easy options. And also, you can send a more junior person out to do that because once you learn how to do precise levelling, it's, um, it's not difficult, right? So there are other sides to these monitoring things aside from just going for the precision, right? Now, I know you'd like to put a tower in the dam with a waterfall coming out the top, you know, and a minaret playing music, you know, and just call it a PSM. Okay. Um, this is a small scale task, and like I said, it was, this is a real life one. Okay, so there's a number of things that I just want to go quickly over and review. We've set out the approaches to deformation modeling, and a lot of it applies to other activities. If you never do, you will always do some sort of deformation modeling. If you do an as constructed survey of a road, right, aren't you to some extent going, so if you, say you did it six months later, aren't you actually going, well, what's deformed? You know, what's actually changed? Was it because the survey was wrong or the construction was wrong or has there been defamation? But there is going to be more and more studies like this because um, whilst it's been quite a while, there's a thing called Dams Australia where, you know, you actually have to guarantee a dam and it has to have a monitoring program. Bridges are coming under more and more control as we use lighter and lighter materials. So the monitoring of the impacts on the bridge and the deformation of bridges, and bridges now can be anything from long, thin to, you know, cut in the side of mountains. It's, the definition of a bridge is a very small thing, right? Now, over-design helps. I mean, that's one of the reasons why there's so many Roman bridges still left after so many years. They just um, overkill, you know, use big stones. You know, but now we tend to go for the cheapest is the best, so monitoring is going to be an important aspect. And the difference between normal surveying is that you've got to realise the monitoring term, the duration is going to be long. So your data has to be documented well. Your monumentation has to be good, right? But the trick behind all this is that you can't get away um, without understanding some of the basic principles. Now, in theory, you're in third year, there should be nothing you don't know about a total station. You should know a total station better than you know your own mum, right? You know. So, don't you know how to use what? Oh, yeah, but you can read the manual. And, yeah. I mean, the variety, when you, they are much of a muchness, right? Some are more precise, some have other better cameras in them, but they do the same sort of thing. You should be, at this stage, very comfortable with the use of it. What you've got to develop is the thing that's underneath it, the quality. To be able to extrapolate that, how to integrate it with GNSS, how to integrate it with lateral thinking, you know? Is there another way of doing something that doesn't just require, oh, we can do anything, you know? We turn the total station on, as long as we've got a spare battery, we should be right. You know, there are other ways of achieving that may be a better achievement or a goal than actually just taking the standard way. So between metrology and this, and then next week with, uh, or two weeks' time, um, some of the high-rise stuff, whilst they are specialist areas in themselves, what you should see underpin all this is the ability to actually use equipment to its best, and more importantly, the ability for you to use your brains for its best. So surveyors are well placed. If you don't, if you don't stay ahead of the game in surveying, you will lose it. It's like UAVs, for example. There's a lot of young surveyors are right into using UAVs. It's good because there are. You might think that anyone can run a UAV, but the reality is, if you understand three-dimensional positioning, right, the mathematics of it, you're in a better place to take a lead role in those things. 
and there'll be things in the future that are um, and UAV is getting more expensive I don't know if seeing you in Toowoomba you should watch Landline last week it's the rural program on the ABC and uh, tracking wild dogs in Western Australia now the UAV they're going to use for that is going to be something like 380,000 US dollars yeah it's a lot of money right so when you think about that because you know, people think about a lot of the cheaper UAVs are you actually going to employ someone who says I know how to fly it or are you going to employ someone that actually says I can decipher the GPS signals the imagery you use we can cross connect it and actually take measurements off it right um, that's where surveyors can come in think laterally it's not all about building up roads and buildings right now the other thing is you've got to keep on top of the equipment but the integrated instruments coming up now I mean the, the Leica this is the something station that has laser scanner, GNSS, total station, coffee machine, spa, you know, the whole lot, right? Um, they're, they're good, right? That's a good idea. But what you've got to do as professional surveyors, and particularly for students, students tend to put themselves down and say, oh, no, people in the professional know that. You are the ones who are up to date, right, to a great extent. So you should be able to think it through and say, what is good? What is fit for purpose? How can I get this task done and achieve the precision that's needed in a reasonable time frame with reasonable equipment? You know, because that's, that's how, if you're in the private sector, it's how you make money. If you're in the government sector, it's how you save taxpayers' money. Right? If you're in university, we just teach it. <laughs> so, so surveyors, you've got to be confident about it. They're in a good position, right? So this is actually a saying by a very well-known person. No, it's not. They made it up, actually. Um, but this is the way I see the profession, right? So you can either agree with it or disagree, but it's a little bit, compared to a lot of professions, a little less structured. You know, a lot of things in civil engineering are very much like apply this formula, add this, put two bricks together, and you start a house, you know? Um, whereas a lot of things in surveying are complex to explain to other people. I hope that gives you some insight.